Hello everyone and welcome back to this nanophotonics and plasmonics course. This video we cover uh, the derivation of the Lorentz reciprocity theorem from Maxwell's uh, curl equations. Uh, so if you start with, uh, as we discussed in part three of chapter two, we discuss with uh, current density distribution J1 of volume v V1 and another uh, current distribution J2 uh, of uh, volume V2, then we can uh, express uh, the fields, magnetic and electric fields generating by those two distributions using Maxwell's equations. So we're gonna be using two set of uh, Maxwell's equations, two set of Maxwell's curl equations describing those fields. Uh, the first one uh, relate uh, the first source J1 uh, so we have the curl of the electric field, uh, which is uh, given by I omega B1. And then we have the curl of the magnetic field uh, generated by the first source G1, which is negative I omega D1 plus J1, which is the, 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 current, the current density service serving as a source. Uh, the second set of Maxwell's equations cor uh, correspond to the second uh, distribution. So we have the curl of E2, which is the electric field generating by this second distribution, I omega B2. And then we have the curl of the magnetic field generating by uh, the second source, which is negative I D2 plus J2. So uh, these are the four uh, curl equations we're going to be using. Uh, so, so now what we need to do is actually uh, manipulate a bit those equations in order to obtain the reciprocity theorem. So what we're going to be doing is that for those four equations, so equation one, equation two, equation three, and equation four, we can actually multiply each of these equations by the complementary field uh, for each equation. So the first equation is looking at the curl of the electric field generating by uh, the first source. So we're gonna multiply this by the magnetic field from the second source. Uh, the second equation, uh, look at uh, the curl of the magnetic field uh, from the first source, and we're gonna be multiplying this by the electric field from the second source. Uh, and then uh, we continue so that we have uh, the curl of E2, so we multiply this by H1, and then we have the curl of H2, so we multiply this by E1. So this is uh, multiplying the whole equation, so we have uh, to multiply also the, the right hand side uh, terms by the same, uh, the same quantity. So we have E2 here, and then we have H1 for equation three, and finally we have E1 for equation four. So <clears throat> what we're gonna be doing with that, uh, now the second step would be actually to, to look at uh, co linear combinations of these, these equations. Uh, so what we're gonna be doing here is taking equation one, adding up equation two, and then subtracting equation three plus equation four. In other words, what we do is equation one plus equation two minus equation three minus equation four. So this is what we need to do. Uh, so if you do that, uh, you can actually uh, show um, a little bit uh, manipulating the the expressions from the left hand side of the equation that the left hand side of the equation is actually equivalent to the divergence of these uh, products, the sum of these products. So the uh, E1 cross H2 minus E2 cross H1. So that's uh, something that can be shown uh, that if you actually take the linear combination of these, uh, these guys on the left-hand side of uh, equation one through four, 
uh, then you can show that this is actually uh, this this term. Uh, then on the right hand side of the equation is uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, so if we take equation one, uh, we have I omega H2, uh, and then B1 actually uh, can be expressed as a function of H1 via the constitutive relation, uh, and it's actually mu node mu H1. And then uh, if we have the uh, minus the equation for uh, the term, so we're just gonna uh, rearrange that a little bit, uh, we can actually write down that this is minus omega H1, the same, we have mu node mu, and then uh, we have H2. So this is coming from uh, minus equation four. Uh, then we have other terms uh, from equation two. So we have negative I omega E2 and something similar here. So the electric displacement D1 can be expressed as a function of the electric field E1 uh, via the constitutive relation epsilon node epsilon E1 and then coming from equation uh, equation four, we actually have uh, plus I omega E1 epsilon node epsilon E2. And then we are left with the last uh, two terms coming from equation two. So we have J1 E2, and then we have uh, the term coming from equation four, which comes with a negative sign and then we have J2 E1. So this is uh, uh, very straightforward. Uh, the first two terms here cancel out each other's. Uh, the other two terms also cancel out and we are left with, uh, with this last uh, expression. So we have the divergence of E1 cross e H2 minus E2 cross H1. So we are looking at cross products and this is equal to J1, which is the source, uh, the first source times the electric field from the, the second source minus the second source times the electric field from the first source. And I'm gonna name this, label this as equation five. So this equation five, uh, now we continue to manipulate this a little bit. Uh, so what we're gonna be doing is actually taking the integral uh, of this equation over large spherical volume. So we have the integral over a volume V, which we can take arbitrary, but we're gonna take it as a spherical volume, uh, and you will see later why. Uh, so this integral over the volume of uh, this equation reads uh, as is. So we have the two, uh, still the gradient of this cross product, and then dv, and then we have also the integral over the volume of the right hand side of the equation, which is going to be the product of the currents with their complementary electric fields or the electric fields from the, the other source. Now uh, we're going to be rewriting the left hand side of this equation uh, using uh, Gauss's theorem. Uh, so Gauss's theorem will allow us to actually rewrite uh, this volume integral uh, from the left hand side. So we have a volume integral of the divergence of uh, a vector over a certain volume. This is actually equal, and that's what the, the Gauss's theorem says, that this is equal to um, an integral of a closed surface of this vector or vector field scalar the normal to the surface. So with this uh, Gauss's theorem, we can rewrite the left-hand side of the equation. So equation five, uh, or actually the, 
equation six, if we label this as equation six, actually leads to writing the left hand side as integral over the closed surface encapsulating the volume V as the vector. So in this case, is the cross product of E1 with H2 minus the cross product of E2 with H1 times a scalar product with the normal to the surface. And the right hand side remains unchanged, so we keep the the volume integral of these uh, these products J two E one, and now what we we need to do is actually uh, uh, include some physical insight uh, into this uh, this uh, this equation. So we are looking at the fields, the electric fields and the magnetic fields are actually far fields. So we're looking at far fields and we're gonna discuss later on uh, the definition between the difference between far field and near field and intermediate fields uh, in, in greater detail. Uh, but that's something we already introduced in, uh, uh, in the first part uh, of this, uh, this chapter two. So those uh, far fields, uh, one of the property of those far fields, they are actually orthogonal. So they are orthogonal to the surface, which is a spherical surface. So that makes uh, something special. So they are orthogonal to the surface, uh, meaning that they are actually parallel to the, to the normal to the surface. So those fields are actually parallel to the normal. So those fields are uh, parallel to the surface, parallel to the normal to the surface. And this will basically automatically imply that this integral over the surface of these products is actually zero. So this scatter product is zero, the integral over the surface is zero. So the left hand side uh, of equation, uh, equation six uh, and basically is zero. So if this is equation seven, same thing, this is zero. So then we, what we, we end up with from equation seven, uh, then therefore we have an integral over the, the volume and if I split the equation in two different terms, the right hand side of the, the equation seven in two different terms, then we have this integral over the volume of J1 E2, which is equal to the integral over the same volume of J2 E1. So now we can actually reduce this a little bit further. And uh, considering that, uh, in fact, the, the, the volume integral of uh, the, uh, the current density J1 is actually uh, reduced only to a volume, J, uh, volume V1. And why? Because outside of this volume V1 that we introduced, the current density is actually zero. So this integral is actually zero. So the uh, domain uh, that uh, the volume can be reduced to is V1. So we have an integral over V1 of J1 E2 dV. And the same uh, can be done on the right hand side of this equation. So the volume uh, onto which the right hand side integral can be uh, estimated to non-zero is actually V2 because the current density is actually zero outside of this volume. And we end up with this, uh, this particular expression, which is the Lorentz reciprocity theorem. 